Peak by Roland Smith. We're on chapter 14, Latecomers. You can follow along on page 93 of your novel. Josh's absence wasn't as bad as I thought, although Zopa worked Sanjo and me like dogs. The morning Josh headed up the mountain, he had us build a six-foot-tall cairn out of rocks around a central flagpole for the puja blessing ceremony. We then placed smaller poles in the ground around the main pole and strung up dozens of prayer flags between them on strings. The flags come in five colors, red, green, yellow, blue, and white, representing the earth's five elements, fire, wood, earth, water, and iron. As the flags flutter in the wind, they release the prayers written on them and pacify the gods. When we finished, Josh had Sanjo and me gather gear from our team's tents and lean it against the cairn to be blessed. Zopa held the ceremony that evening for a German and Italian climbing party going up the next morning, and for our group in absentia, which he said wasn't ideal, but it sometimes worked. He recited several Buddhist prayers, then asked the mountain for permission for us to climb it, in German, English, and Italian, which was impressive. The ceremony took about three hours, and just as it was ending, a black bird landed on the main flagpole, which Zopa said was very auspicious. What kind of bird was that? I asked, as we headed back to camp. It looked kind of like a crow or a raven. Sun Joe shrugged. It turned out that even though Holly Angelo was right next door to me, she was relatively easy to avoid. She never left her tent before ten. I was out of mine by seven every morning. Because there were so many people in the camp, it was easy to get lost among the tents, unless you were Holly, who wore the most garish colored snow suits on the slope. I could pick her out a mile away and hide. She did manage to snag me for dinner the fourth night. Josh was gone. I made the mistake of heading back to my tent to drop off my ice axe before dinner. Zopa had been giving Sanjo and me self-arrest lessons. And Holly was waiting for me like a guard dog. The food was better than what they offered in the mess tent, but the atmosphere was grim. Ralph sat on his massage table with a permanent pout on his face, as if he were waiting for customers he knew would never come. Chef Pierre watched every bite of food I took and muttered about the barbaric cooking conditions at 18,000 feet. And Holly? Well, my headache came back, but it wasn't from the altitude. Inside a, inside a tent, her voice was shrill enough to sour yak butter. She was no longer gasping, which I missed because the pauses gave my ears a chance to rest. I thought she was going to interview me, but it turned out that I was there to listen to her interview herself. During the two-hour non-stop monologue, she filled me in on her life, year by boring year. It didn't really start to, I didn't really start tuning in until she, until she turned 18, but even then it wasn't very interesting. She'd been married three times, and her current husband lived in Rome, and she rarely saw him. She came from a wealthy family and didn't have to work for a living. She became a journalist, as she called it, against her father's wishes because she felt it was her moral responsibility to tell the truth. I didn't mention that in the article she'd written about us there were several things that were blatantly untrue. I also think she exaggerated her climbing conquest because when I asked her what mountains she had climbed, she said, you know, all the big ones, and quickly changed the subject to dreams, asking if I ever have them. Yes? Well, let me tell you about one I had just last night, she said. I hate hearing about people's dreams, but I was spared by the arrival of William Blade and three bodyguards the size of yetis. In his films, William Blade had been shot, stabbed, starved, beaten, and tortured, but he had never looked worse than when he hobbled into Holly's tent. His back went out, one of the bodyguards explained. We were wondering if your massage therapist can put him right. Of course, Holly said, pushing things out of the way, including me, to make room. Ralph smiled for the first time since he had arrived on the mountain and gleefully began laying out liniments and lotions and flexing his muscles, which weren't very impressive. I stayed long enough to watch them get Blade out of his clothes and onto the table. 
where he started yelling and swearing at everyone in the tent as if they were personally responsible for his bad back. I didn't see what happened the next day. Zopa had Sunjo and me climbing a treacherous icefall outside camp, but we heard all about it when we got back that afternoon. After Ralph worked his magic on the film hero's back, Blade offered to pay him twice as much as Holly was paying him to move over to his camp. Apparently, Ralph couldn't get his gear together fast enough. When Pierre saw this, he begged Blade to take him too, which he did, leaving Holly absolutely alone in her giant pink tent, screaming in rage. The bet was she was going to quit the mountain. The only person who put cash down on her staying was Zopa. He met everyone's wager with the money he had gotten from his cigarette sales. It was hours after the incident before Holly emerged from her tent. It turned out that she wasn't about to head home to her, up, to her Upper East Side penthouse apartment. We were in the mess tent waiting to hear from Josh and the team up at ABC. They were supposed to leave that morning for base camp, but got pinned down by a snowstorm. We had heard that some of the people up there had hape, but the storm had knocked out further radio communication, so we didn't know how, who was sick or how bad it was. If the team wasn't able to start down the next day, the situation would turn critical. They had brought only enough food for two days at ABC. A couple of the Sherpas were talking about hauling up some food for them. Not tonight, Zopa said. The storm is moving down the hill. The Sherpas and a small group of other climbers were arguing with Zopa about his weather predictions when Holly sauntered into the mess tent. I'm going to the top, she announced calmly, then walked over and got a plate of food. The only person smiling was Zopa. And why not? He had just won a pot of money, literally. The mess cook had been keeping the bets in a 10-gallon rice cooker, which was now overflowing with rupees. Sanjo had told me that if Zopa won the bet, he would give the money to the Tibetan monks. They would have to wait to get their cash. I didn't know this yet, but just like Holly, Zopa had no plans to go home any time soon. The snow is here, one of the Sherpas said. That's impossible, I said. I hadn't been in the tent more than 20 minutes. When I'd walked over from HQ, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. The cook pulled the flap back, and we stared outside in disbelief. The snow was so thick, I wasn't sure how I was going to find my tent.